<laughs> good to see everyone this morning. We're glad that you can be here. It's good to be back. Uh, appreciate uh, Chris filling in last Sunday and uh, uh, Steve Robb on the, the Wednesday night that we were away. We had a great, great trip. We worshiped last Sunday with Kevin and Paula Reed in the uh, church in Norman G, Texas. And I'll tell you later where that is if you want to know. But uh, we had a great visit with them. They send their love and their greetings to everybody. And uh, they're doing quite well. And, and it was great to get to spend time with them as well as with lots of other uh, family and friends. I'd like for you to think for a minute. I had to think about this when I asked myself the question. What's the most number of people you've ever seen baptized at one time? Most number of people you've ever seen baptized at one time. The most that I can recall was back in 1991 in, uh, in Kiev. At the end of a campaign, we baptized, I think, about 25 people. I don't remember ever seeing more than that baptized at one time. Maybe you have. I hope that you, that you have had occasion to do that. Other than that, probably the most is five or six uh, at one time, you know, perhaps in a gospel meeting or something uh, of that nature. The reason I bring that up is when I read Acts 13 and 14 and about Paul and Barnabas and their first missionary journey, I think about how satisfying it must have been to them to come to the close of that journey having converted so many people. Because they reached a lot of people on that first journey. You look at chapter four, uh, 13, verses 1 to 3. They were sent out by the church in Antioch, having been selected by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul to the work to which I have called them. And they went out preaching in the cities of Asia Minor. On the island of Cyprus, they preached in the synagogues and they won many converts, including the Roman proconsul of the island. That was quite an accomplishment. And also, uh, after an eloquent sermon in the syna uh, synagogue at Antioch of Pisidia, there were 17 cities named Antioch, by the way, in the ancient world. So this is the one in Pisidia. Uh, in Antioch of Pisidia, Paul preached in the synagogue there, and there were many Jews and devout converts to Judaism followed them, and the crowd begged them to return the next Sabbath. When they went back on the next Sabbath, the Jews had become resistant to the message, but the Jews were, uh, the Gentiles were happy to hear that the gospel was for them too, and many of them believed, Scripture says. Chapter uh, 14, verses 1 following, says that the synagogue in Iconium, both Jews and Greeks believed. Paul and Barnabas got run out of town, but they continued to preach throughout the countryside. And at Lystra, Paul encountered a man who'd, who was lame in his feet, had never been able to walk. And he healed him. And the people, because of their pagan backgrounds, thought that they must be some of the pagan gods, having come down to them in the form of men. They thought that they were Zeus and Hermes. And they brought oxen to slaughter, and they brought wreaths to offer uh, to them because they thought the gods were among them. And it was all that Paul and Barnabas could do to get to restrain them from doing that. But they continued to preach the gospel there, and then they went on to Derby and made many disciples there. It seemed that everywhere they went, there was a harvest of people who were brought to Christ. Now, after winning so many converts and establishing so many churches, we might have thought that that was the end of the journey. We might have thought that, well, it's over now. They can go back to Antioch. They can rest up a bit. They can get ready for their second journey. But that's not the case. It turns out that as they came toward the end of that first journey, they had some unfinished business. And what we read about just a minute ago in Acts 14, 21 to 23, is the fact that they returned to the cities where they had already been. It's important to note that. This is not new territory. They're returning to the cities where they have already been, where they've already established churches because they had unfinished business in those places. Now, that unfinished business consisted of three separate but closely interrelated parts. You notice, first of all, uh, in verse 22, part one is they were strengthening the souls of the disciples. They went back and strengthened the souls of these new converts that they had led to Christ. They did that, the Bible says, by encouraging them to continue in the faith. You know, Jesus had made it clear that a once upon a time 
discipleship was not going to lead to salvation. In his parable of the sower, he talked about seed that, that sprouted but then was choked out by the thorns, he said, by the cares of this world and sometimes by opposition, and it yields what? No fruit at all. It does not lead to salvation. And once when a, a man told him that I, I would follow you, but first let me go bury my father, he said, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. So they encourage them to continue in the faith. Don't, don't give up. When things get difficult, don't stop following Jesus. Follow through on this newfound faith that you now have. And they also told them that there were many tribulations, that through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. Paul had only recently been stoned and left for dead. And he wanted them to know that following Jesus was not going to be a bed of roses. It was not going to be an easy path. But it was going to be a, different, a difficult way to walk. And it was going to be challenging. It was going to be demanding. So that was part one. They encouraged the souls of the disciples. Part two is in verse 23. They appointed elders for them in every church. They knew they were going to need shepherds to watch out for the flock. They knew that these churches needed the same thing that Paul later wrote to Titus in chapter 1 and verse 5 when he said, this is why I left you in Crete, that you might put what remained in order and appoint elders in every town. There was unfinished business on Crete too. And part of that unfinished business was the appointing of elders. And so Paul and Barnabas appointed elders for them in these churches. Part 3 of this unfinished business is stated in verse 23 also. And they committed them to the Lord in whom they had believed. There was only so much that Paul and Barnabas could do. They could preach the gospel. They could teach. They could encourage. They could warn. They could do all kinds of things. But at the end of the day, they simply had to commit these people into the hands of God and leave them there. You know, ultimately for all of us, it is God who keeps us in his care, isn't it? It's God who gets us home. It's God who takes care of us. And so they committed them to the Lord in whom they had believed. And only when they had strengthened and organized these new believers was their work with them complete. Now, since this is one of the few New Testament texts that mentions the appointment of elders, that's of special interest to us because we're about to begin that process. You can look in your bulletin there and you'll, you'll see the schedule. It's going to start here very soon, two weeks from today. And it's an important process and it's an important part of the work of this church and of every church. So this text is of special importance to us because, for one thing, it's one of the earliest references that we have to uh, elders. Now, we've got an earlier reference in Acts 11, verse 30. We know that the church in Jerusalem had elders. Because we're told that uh, the church in Antioch resolved to send aid to the suffering Christians in Judea, suffering due to a famine. And they did so, the Bible says, sending it to the elders by the hand of Barnabas and Saul. So the Jerusalem church already had elders. We're not told how they got those elders. We're not told how they were selected. We're not told when that came about. But the Jerusalem church had elders. And so that raises a question, doesn't it? How were those elders appointed? How were these elders in Acts 14 appointed? Well, when you read Acts 14, verse 23, it says, when they, Paul and Barnabas, had appointed elders for them. It sounds as if they just chose the people and put them in place. And that may, in fact, be what happened. But we need to understand, too, that this word appointed literally means to stretch out the hand and it was often used in, in ancient times to describe stretching up your hand to vote. Stretching up your hand to show the choice that you wanted to make. Voting by a show of hands. So possibly what Acts 14.23 is saying is that the churches in these different places chose the people. And then the apostles ratified that and put them into place. We really can't be sure. It's impossible to know. But the, what it shows us is that the New Testament writers pay little attention to the process of selection. What the New Testament writers pay attention to is the qualifications 
and the responsibilities of elders, not how they're chosen, but who's chosen and the characteristics that they have as they're chosen. Now, Acts 14, 23 raises some other questions that we need to think about as well. First of all, why did Paul and Barnabas decide to appoint elders at all? There are people who don't exactly trust the biblical records, who don't believe that this happened this early in the history of the church. They think the appointment of elders and then deacons is something that came along later in the second century. They just don't believe that it was happening and that uh, Luke has kind of written this in to the history and that these churches were just sort of loosely knit and loosely organized and they just kind of functioned under the leadership of the spirit and so forth. Well, not only does that go against what scripture says, but it also goes against the reality that there was a need to strengthen the souls of these disciples, that the appointment of these elders was for that purpose. It was to help strengthen these churches. They knew that they were going to need leadership. They were going to need mature Christians who would watch out for the entire group. They were going to need John 10 type of shepherds. They were going to need shepherds who knew the sheep and the sheep knew them and trusted them. And they would uh, be the door for the sheep and they would watch out for them. And they would bring back those who strayed. They knew they were going to need that. And so they appointed elders. Besides, if leaders are not appointed, somebody will take the lead. In any group, that's the case. If there is not designated leadership, appointed leadership, somebody will take the lead. And it's no different in the church. Now, that may not be bad. It may be that that person or pe persons who take the lead do a good job, that they have a good intention, a good motive. But it, it may also be the other way around. It may be that people see here an opportunity to assert themselves. You do remember Diotrephes, the book of 3 John, the would-be leader, he's called. But in both texts where Paul gives lists of quali qualifications of elders, 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1, the context has to do with protecting the church from false teachers and from divisive people. Somebody has to take the lead in dealing with those problems. Somebody has to step up and take the lead. And good leadership is the best defense against that kind of thing. So that's why they appointed elders for them. They knew they were going to need it. They knew they were going to need this kind of appointed leadership. Another question that sometimes comes up about Acts 14, 23 is, did Paul appoint unqualified men? And you might hear that question and think, well, of course he didn't. Why, why would anybody ever ask that? Well, the reason they ask that is you, you notice that when you go back and look at the history of this, that to the best of our knowledge, the whole first missionary journey only occupied about a year and a half. That means that nobody in any of these churches had been a Christian for even as long as two years. And if you look at 1 Timothy 1.6, you'll find Paul saying that an elder must not be a recent convert. And less than two years sounds pretty recent, doesn't it? It doesn't sound uh, like someone who's been at it for a long time. So that raises the question, did, did Paul, because of the circumstances, because of the situation, just appoint the best who were there, rather than following his own qualifications list that he gives in 1 Timothy 3 and in Titus 1? Was he breaking his own rule? Well, the answer to that question, I think, is no, he did not, because there were mature believers in those churches. Remember where most of these converts came from. They came from the preaching of the apostles in the synagogues. They came from the preaching to both Jews and Gentiles. In fact, their preaching almost always began in the synagogues when they went to these new cities. Chapter 13 in verse 43 says, In Antioch of Pisidia, many Jews and devout converts to Judaism followed Paul and Barnabas, who urged them to continue in the grace of God. Chapter 14 and verse 1, At Iconium they preached in the synagogue and spoke in such a way that a great number of both Jews and Greeks believed. Now, among those people were undoubtedly people who had been worshiping in the synagogue for a long, long time. 
In other words, these were people who through synagogue worship had heard the scriptures read every Sabbath because that's what synagogue worship mostly consisted of, a reading from the law and the reading from the prophets. These would have been people who had been hearing for years about the coming of a Messiah and who had faith in that promise and the only thing they needed to complete that faith was the knowledge that this Messiah is, in fact, Jesus of Nazareth. And when that last piece of the puzzle was put into place for them, then they had a mature, whole faith because they were already mature believers because they knew the scriptures so well. They were not novices in the faith at all. And that would have been true both of the Jews who had grown up in the synagogue and probably also some of the what are called God-fearing Gentiles, some of those Gentiles who worshipped at the synagogue, who practiced the Jewish religion but had never been circumcised. Any of those people could have been mature enough to have known the Scriptures and to have provided the kind of leadership that elders would need to provide. J.W. McGarvey describes these people as the ripest fruits of the Jewish synagogue. The ripest fruits of the Jewish synagogue. So no, Paul did not appoint unqualified men to be elders. Well, you might be wondering, why is this important? Why even ask that question at all? And here's the reason it's important. Because it emphasizes the fact that those who are chosen and approved by the congregation must be, and that's Paul's word in both 1 Timothy and in Titus, they must be qualified or else they cannot be put in those roles. They must be. And Paul wasn't dispensing with those qualifications when he appointed the men in Acts 14 and verse 23. Sometimes people have the idea, well, we look around and we try to match those qualifications to people, and we don't see people who fulfill them. So what do we do? We just take the best we've got, and, and we appoint them anyway. That's a sure recipe for disaster. That's not going to work. Scripture says they must have these qualities for a reason. It says for a reason that they must be qualified or else cannot serve. They can't simply be the best we have and yet not qualified. In seeking elders, we must seek qualified men, not, not so that we must have elders, but we must have qualified elders. Paul had that concern in Acts 14, just as he had it when he wrote to Timothy and to Titus. Well, that leads to another question, doesn't it? What if there aren't qualified men to appoint? Well, if we're going to be faithful to what Scripture says, it means we can't appoint anybody. Because to do so would be a violation of what Scripture clearly teaches. Well, that leads to another question in some people's minds. Can a church really be a church? if it doesn't have elders? And the answer is yes, of course. Go back and read Acts 14 again. Those churches in Antioch and in Iconium and in Derby and in Lystra were already churches before verse 23. They were already churches. They were already God's people. They were already followers of Jesus. The appointing of the elders was simply uh, to bring them further in their development. It not, did not mean that they were not churches until that time. Having elders isn't what makes a church a church. Being in Christ is what makes a church a church. Some folks have the idea that until we perfectly match a biblical pattern of organization that we're not really the church. That's simply not true. That's simply not true. Now, make no mistake, having elders in every church is the biblical ideal. It is the biblical standard. And no church should ever be content until it has the appointed leadership that Acts 14 describes. And notice that there are always a plurality of these men, as in Acts 14 and verse 23. They didn't go and appoint an elder in each church they appointed elders for them in each church. So there must always be a plurality of these men. But until we have that, we should not be satisfied. We should not be content. If we, if we don't have the people to put in those positions, then we need to work on that. We need to do something about that. We need to change that. 
But the way you work on it is not by putting in qualified people in that role. Acts 14 does not cancel out 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1 or John 10. We cannot sacrifice the requirements for qualified leaders simply so we can say we have leaders. This leads to another question. Why did churches sometimes not have qualified men to serve as elders or shepherds? Or maybe have so few? There are a lot of reasons for this. And I'm just going to suggest a few. One is that sadly, most men in the church don't attempt to qualify themselves. They don't think early on that this is something that they set as a goal. Paul said in 1 Timothy 3, in verse 1, The saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a noble work. I've heard people say sometimes that it's wrong to want to be an elder. That's not true. Look at that verse again. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a noble work. It ought to be something that all Christian men aspire to, whether we actually ever fill that role or not, that we would be qualified to fill that role. It isn't wrong to want to do that. It's wrong if you have the wrong motives. Peter describes some of those wrong motives in 1 Peter 5. He says, not under compulsion, but willingly, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, uh, not as domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. But notice as he talks about those false motives, he talks about good motives too. There are good positive motives for wanting to be an elder. And we need more people who desire to do that. It's really uh, to our detriment that more Christian men don't see themselves and set themselves the goal of being leaders in the church. After all, other than what we might describe as the family requirements of being married and having believing children and so forth. Other than that, the qualities that are listed in 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1 should be characteristics of all believers. It should be things that we all strive for. It should be things that we are all trying to live up to, not just a few. But it usually doesn't happen without conscious preparation. It doesn't usually happen without the desire. And I want to just say right now to those of you who are younger, Set yourself the goal now to qualify yourself to be able to be a servant of the Lord in the capacity of an elder or shepherd. It's one of the highest goals you could ever set for yourself. But make that decision now that you're going to so live your life that there wouldn't be anything that would rule you out. doesn't mean you'll ever serve, but hopefully when the time comes, you would be able to. Set yourself that goal. Another reason sometimes churches don't have qualified men is that there are those who are qualified based on what Paul says, but they don't have the desire. They're not willing to do it. Now, that can be for a variety of reasons, some valid, some not. Each individual has to decide that for himself. Each individual has to, to think about that and pray about that in regard to his own life. But we also need to weigh that decision not to serve in that capacity against the needs of the church. Does the church need me to do this? If you think about it, some of God's most effective servants in Scripture were people who were reluctant to accept a role. Think about Moses. I don't guess there's a greater leader in all the Bible than Moses. And you remember Moses when God first spoke to him from the burning bush and said, I want you to go tell Pharaoh to let my people go? And, and Moses did everything he possibly could to, to avoid that, that task. He said, Lord, I'm not eloquent. I can't speak well enough. I can't before, go, go before this king and, and say those things. God said, that's all right. I'll send your brother Aaron. You just tell him what to say. He's eloquent. He can speak. We'll take care of that. And then he said, but the people won't believe me. So I gave him the rod that turned into a snake. Uh, and he said, that'll convince them. And finally, he just said, send somebody else. You ever felt like that? I have. Send somebody. God, please, just get somebody else to do this. Just leave me out of this. I'll pray. 
I'll cheer. I'll do whatever you want me to do, but just leave me out of this. That's, that's, that was Moses' attitude. And God said, go. Go. And Moses went. And you know the rest of the story. He became Israel's greatest leader ever. Then there was Esther. When Esther was told by her cousin Mordecai, you need to go in to King Ahasuerus and intervene because if you don't, if you don't intercede for your people, they're going to all be wiped out. And she said, but the king has not sent for me now in 30 days. And if I go into his presence without being summoned and he doesn't hold forth the royal scepter to me, it would mean the end of my life. And you remember Mordecai's words to her. Don't think that because you're in the palace that you'll escape what the rest of us suffer. And besides, who knows but what you may have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. You may have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. And she went. And she saved her people. Having the ability to serve God's people as a shepherd is a form of stewardship. And because it is a stewardship, it needs to be carefully used and we need to carefully weigh any decision to decline it. Another reason churches often lack qualified leaders is they simply don't place a premium on leadership development. And so the pool of potential leaders gradually just dries up. It just disappears. We had Bob Turner here a few months ago, and Bob's really quite an authority on leadership and, and church development and so forth. And he points out that churches need to continually be developing and training new leaders because if we don't, the pool just shrinks and shrinks. He made an amazing statement, gave an amazing statistic. The majority of churches of Christ have how many elders, would you guess? The majority have two and that's what we have. And when you have two, there's always the hazard that something's going to happen to one of them, that one of them is going to pass away or be unable to serve for some reason or decline to serve or whatever. And then you have one, which means you have none because you have to have a plurality. So the majority of churches of Christ are teetering on the brink of not having the leadership that they need. Why? Because we've not developed the leadership pool. We have not had people who are trained and ready to step into that role. Leadership development needs to be a consistent part of the teaching program of every church. I've often thought that we ask our elders very frequently to take on an unfair task. We ask them to take on a task that we acknowledge based on scripture is of extraordinary importance. It is of profound importance. And yet we offer them, I ask them to take that role with almost no training whatsoever and very little preparation other than the preparation that every Christian has from following Jesus, but without any kind of, of insight into leadership or leadership development or what it means to lead the church or how to deal with issues and problems that arise within the church. We just expect them to jump in there and kind of sink or swim. And it's really not fair. We would never, we would never accept that in preachers. Why do we think it's the norm for elders? The bottom line is, this time of shepherd selection is a good time for us to reassess our whole approach to church leadership. We really need to do that. We need to reassess how we think about it. We need to reassess what we do or don't do as far as leadership development. We need to develop the idea that we should place at a premium, the idea of having only the very finest leadership in place for God's church, that nothing else will do, that nothing else is acceptable, that we should have shepherds who know the sheep, 
and the sheep know and trust the shepherds and who are willing to put themselves last in order to serve the best interest of the church and who are examples to the church of what Christian living ought to be. Men who know the word and are able to teach it to others, who will not flinch when it comes to protecting the flock from the wolves who would destroy it, who will not sit by and watch people stray away from Christ and do nothing because they have shepherds' hearts and they know they must go after them. Men who honor Christ by the way they serve and lead his people. That's what we have to look for. That's all that God's word will allow us to do. And until we have done that, our business, our business remains unfinished. Let's bow and pray together, please. Holy Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the body of Christ. We thank you, Father, for the privilege of being your people. Father, we do it so imperfectly, and we know that we do. We always need your strength. We always need your guidance. We always need your forgiveness. And Father, we need your blessing. And as we approach this time of selecting of shepherds, we pray, Lord, that you would give us your wisdom as a congregation, that you would give us the determination to look into your word deeply, to think on it carefully, and to select wisely. Guide and bless us, Father, that we might have the leadership that we need, that we might be the people that you have called us to be, that we might serve you in a way that we're in glory and honor to your name. We ask it all in the name of Jesus. Amen. We're going to sing this invitation hymn. If you're not yet following Christ, you haven't confessed him, been baptized into his death, and risen to new life. We hope you'll take advantage of this opportunity today. Let's stand together and sing.